Plants vs Zombies 2 is, shockingly enough, a game with plants. Yeah, I'm not doing this bit again. <laughs> a short while back, I covered some very overrated plants, where I called a lot of plants overrated, and people got mad at me because internet. Joking aside, the main reason I called these plants overrated is that other options were usually strictly better, rather than because those plants are necessarily bad. This will be a similar case. These plants are themselves not necessarily good, though most of them really are, but people misjudge them and how effective they can be. Oh, and for the record, I will not be talking about plants I said as better options strictly as in the overrated plants video. A lot of these plants are very underrated by default, but a lot of these plants don't need to be brought up again. However, I will list off plants here that really do fall to this, and won't be covered here, because some people may just click this wanting some strong plants to use. Stunning and Installia are great stalls at Outclass Iceberg, and Cauliflower is just one of the best plants in general. Right, now that's out the way. What makes a plant underrated is hard to define, and I want to expressly say that these plants aren't underrated to everyone, just a lot of people. To some people, they may, in fact, overrate these plants. It's a matter of personal preference, I just want to talk about some underrated plants that I think are common enough to mention. Now, with that said, let's talk about one that absolutely is not underrated, but like, enough people try to correct me on it, that I like being a bit petty. I feel that every time I mention that Wintermelon is overpowered, People try to, well actually, me about this. I just want to point out that, yeah no, you're just wrong if you don't think this thing's absurd. I'll keep this relatively brief, but I do think this needs to be here. Winter deals really good damage in a 3 times 3 area. Shields all the zombies to half speed that functionally doubles its already high damage output. It costs a lot of sun in a game where it's super easy to gather thousands of suns within a few waves, and the other best plants in the game are usually plants that synergize well with Wintermelon, or uh, Magnifying Grass, which is the only plant that doesn't really care about it. Generally, if you don't find Wintermelon that effective, it's usually because of modes like Arena. You see, this session will particularly me explaining that Arena will not actually be considered in this video, or really most of my videos. Winter has weak leveling, and just isn't very good in a mode like Arena. A lot of plants will be like this, so keep this in mind. I'm considering base forms, level 1, in the main game only. Now, with that said, let's cover the first actually underrated plant, Bowling Ball. I've covered this guy before. I'd still say that it's overall fairly underrated. At the base level, I mean. Leveled Bowling Bulb is obviously absurdly powerful, as its main gimmick meant to weaken it just isn't relevant anymore. But this gimmick doesn't really hold it back all too much normally, as long as you play well with it. Bowling Bulb has some of the highest EPS in the entire game. In fact, it's one of the few plans capable of dealing so much damage that levels can go from being 5 minutes long to 2 minutes long. It's seriously a plan for nuclear power, that can tend to struggle when the player doesn't support it well. This is likely the reason Bowling Bulb isn't more popular. It doesn't seem super strong unless you understand the intricacies of how it's played. In other words, know how to abuse instant plants to make its weaknesses practically non-existent. Use it with an abundance of instant plants, such as Guacodile, Jalapeno, or just more basic Cherry Bomb or Ghost Pepper. This allows you to open up lanes, clear up clumps that Bowling Bulb can't manage, or otherwise can't be dealt with. This will also allow you to grow back the big bulbs sometimes, and often these can go nuclear and wreck half the field incredibly hard. Using Bowling Bull well is all about maximizing the amount of damage it can offer, though it can also work well with proper support plants. These can include just using Bowling Bulb as a damage dealing support to other plants, which can help make up for the consistency issue. It's not a one size fits all plant though, so you can't just slap it onto your strategy and go, yes, this is fine. It'll probably not work for you, unless you are, you know, using a lot of instances anyways, basically. Sadly, it's a plant given super late into the game, so it's a bit late to pick up a new, complicated plant for the benefit of about one world. It's just not very good in a world where half the zombies are high speed, spawn grid items that screw the bowling bulb hard, and otherwise just muck them up really, really hard. This is also a huge weakness of a bulb. 
it can't deal with great items well. It can help with a ton of graves in the beginning of a level, but it often can't clear them up well by the mid game. Basically, just use Bowling Blob well and it can be incredible. It's great for clearing up half the entire field if used well, and it can make levels speed up a ton. It's probably the biggest DPS plant in the entire game, and it's certainly good for it. Now, let's move on to a plant that I swear people don't understand. Guacodile. Guacodile is not a 125 cost pea shooter that rushes if things get close. That is the number one mistake people make with Quarkadile. It is, instead, a 125 cost, 5 sex recharge, instant plant that can neutralize major threats whenever they appear. Pretty big difference, though I think it's worth explaining what I mean here. You see, Quarkadile is a very unique plant and a powerful tool in a game where, again, and this will be emphasized a lot in this video, sun can quickly become worthless, and even if it wasn't, Wakatel can still do a lot of things that are very helpful. 5 seconds recharge is great for any form of instant damage, insanely so. It can control basically anything at any time, and while it can quickly drain sun, you can just not use it when you don't need it. A complicated plan, clearly, but a very important one that can be easily forgotten. Either way, Wakatel's damage as an insta is somewhat inconsistent. It's usually 450 damage to targets in its lane as long as it doesn't miss, but it can sometimes deal 600 damage if you time it right, and sometimes less if you place it awkwardly. Generally, you should try to place it when targets are on the right side of the field, basically. That means it can deal solid lane-wide damage that can clear on most threats quite readily, as a lot of zombies don't have a lot of HP. Speaking of which, don't assume walker dials are second lawn mowers under any circumstances. Mowers are an emergency option that tends to only be played in the early game if you screw it up, or late game if you cancel out for the final wave. Crocodile is not a last resort, it's a mid game support plant that can manipulate zombie hordes to ensure they can't grow big enough. You use Crocodile to leave zombies like Octo or Fisher vulnerable, on low HP, and just murder everything else. Crocodile is a good way to remove low health special zombies from anywhere in the field. Especially helpful in the Invasive Tour, where it can quickly clear a lane out of all breakdances, MCs, and other similar threats. It's very worth using in a deck if you have spare space for this reason, and even outside of this, you can chip away at some targets this way. Most enemies do not like having everything around them removed, and can deal a lot more damage than you'd expect. Crocodile is pretty much always underrated because people don't play that it's not a pea shooter, and that is its weakest trait. Just try to ignore this trade. I mean, it's so unimportant to plant that I genuinely use Ecclesia's Guacodile and Vanilla's Guacodile the exact same way, and they are about as good as each other. And Ecclesia's Guacodile literally just cannot shoot. It's a good showcase how relevant the damage is. Anyways, from strong plants to other strong plants, let's cover a plant that is very forgotten, but to be frank, would absolutely wreck crap if some other plants got removed. Let's cover probably the most ignored powerful plant for a million and a half valid reasons, Coconut Cannon. Coconut Cannon is a very potent plant that, if a few other plants were removed, would probably be more generally recognized as a great plant. Either way, Coconut Cannon has a ton of straight up fantastic traits that make it one of the strongest plants in the game, but just barely not strong enough to be among those plants. Let me explain what I mean. Coconut Cannon has some incredible stats across the board. It has some fantastic damage that is far stronger than most things are. Mostly because it's cost as the second most expensive main game plant. I mean, both Banana and Wintermelon cost 500 sun, so that's basically the same thing. And Tile Denim is wild and, like, technically costs zero sun anyways. Whatever. 400 sun is a lot for a plant, and Coco uses it well. Coconut Cannon fires heavy shots when clicked on, or pressed, once every 15 seconds. These shots do 900 damage on a direct hit, and 300 damage in a 3x3 area around it. This is a lot of damage, which, unlike a lot of other plants, is also entirely manual, a huge upside. You always have full control with Coconut Cannon. No matter what happens, you can't trigger waves automatically, unless you actually accidentally mucked up a shot. 
Either way, it gives the plant a lot of utility that would make it fantastic, as well as upgrades like Shovel Boost that give it a lot of good sides. Unfortunately, like, every plant after Coconut Can now classes it. Banana Launcher is the key example. It has much better range than Coconut Cannon, as well as a similar overall damage radius, but a huge amount of damage to all targets in it, with Coconut being much weaker overall for it. It could have been the most expensive plant, which would have been a fairly useful trait due to it being the best at beats of good sun production, except that Winnerman existed since version 1 and has so much powerful traits to make up for its marginally higher cost, only really losing out and being manual in exchange for the best traits in the game. Oh, and it gets basically entirely outclassed by Magni, a plant many people consider to be the absolute best in the game and is admittedly hard to argue with. I think Magnifying Grass does ruin a lot of what Kogna tries to do, at any rate. It's got zero cooldown time on its shots, full control with no need to splash, really the only times it fails are cases where Coco would simply just not be worth bringing, which makes Coconut Cannon thoroughly outclassed. However, Coconut Cannon is not bad. That's the key takeaway. If you nerf the absolute best in the game, often, Coconut Cannon just becomes a default. It's hard to use, a bit finickier for sure, but it can perform just as well if you can use its traits well. It's extremely underrated. It being a class doesn't remove the fact it just so happens to be an amazing damager, or that it has great stats, or the fact it's manual. Either way, let's move on to the next plant. This is a plant I've covered before, but is straight up among the best plants in the game, and is severely underrated for it. Introducing Chard Guy. Chard Guard is one of the most insane plants in the entire game. It's just an incredible plant all around with really little weaknesses. Knockback is one of the most powerful traits in the entire game, as it allows you to reverse zombie progress instead of just slowing it, which is an incredible trait you should never forget about. And unlike other knockback options, Chard Guard has more than a few good traits more or less exclusive to itself compared to the others, and it's one of the best plants in the game for that reason, and thusly, very underrated. Chard Guard is a very cheap plant, only costing 75 sun. It also has a particularly strong recharge at only 15 seconds. This makes a plant able to react to most threats as they come. Chard Guard pushes an area of zombies around itself backwards. It does this up to three times, but that is often more than enough, as the area is surprisingly large, and it can catch a lot of zombies in that radius. It also pushes zombies a far distance back, up to 3-ish tiles. This is a lot more than most other knockback options in the game, and more than enough that Chard Guard can be used reliably to lock down lanes. It's not rare for Chard Guard to entirely lock down where it is placed with little that can actually stop it, and often it can cover several lanes at once. And because it's not a true insta plant, you can actually place it ahead of certain zombies, which is an incredible trait. It's also one of the best anti gog options in the entire game. It outranges them and can knock it back very far for its troubles. A full charge can straight up double, or more realistically triple, the amount of time they spend on the board. It's nuts, honestly, and it gives you so much more leeway. And while doing this, it's often going to catch other zombies with a gargantua too, making it one of the most reliable options at doing this. Furthermore, Chard Guard has some insanely broken synergies with other plants, most notably Blover, which allows it to essentially one-shot everything in the game. But lesser known is Aloe Chard, which is basically unstoppable and unremovable. I think I've covered this before, but basically when Aloe heals Chard, it fully restores all its leaves, and it gets dumb, as Aloe will always heal Chard before it dies unless you're under extreme situations. If you use plants like Banana Well, that won't really happen, well, ever really. Overall, I think Chard got it underrated because people have eyes for a few wall plants as is, and Chard lacks that permanent appeal other wall plants have. I think it's an easy trap to fall into, but one that you need to snap yourself out of. After all, no wall plant is permanent, and Chard God being less permanent than other walls is straight up a strength to it, as it allows you to stun shovel it for a huge refund on its cost. 
It's stuff like this which makes Child God extremely underrated, and one of the best plants in the game. Full stop. Anyways, one last plant to cover. This is a plant that is underrated more so because people don't realise just how absurd it can be. And it is a truly absurd option. Introducing the last plant of the video. Banana Launch. The last non-shadow plant unlocked in the entire game. As the last plant in Big Wave Beach. It coming so late means people don't really master the plant. Which is unfortunate because when you do it becomes one of the best plants in the entire game, especially in casual levels where the hordes aren't large enough for plants like Winter to be so crucial. Banana Launcher is on par with Wintermelon for being the most expensive plant in the game. And as I have said before, expensive plants are insanely strong in PZ2. The full reasoning is just that once you learn how to manage sun production, you can get them really quickly, and a lot of really good plants in the game are also absurdly cheap. See Celery, so ramping up your sun production is really easy. And, unlike other options, Banana Launcher allows you to transfer sun into fully controllable direct damage, which is unique to Banana and Magnifying Grass again. Out of these two though, Banana is more usable in a normal deck. Magni strats tend to be focused almost entirely on Magni, using it as your one and only main damage. Banana, meanwhile, can be used with other plants, and really benefits from other attackers, especially considering its insane amount of damage in 1.2 thousand per shot, every 20 seconds. Now, consider how I think Kona Cannon is an incredible plant, and Banana is better. This thing hits like a truck. Now, it may seem like it's difficult to use, but it's honestly not all that bad. Using Banana may seem like an intensely complex series of mind games to prioritize threats right, but really it's more about flinging as many half useful bananas at the enemies as you can, while trying to place as many bananas on the field as possible. Basically, if you have a shot ready, you should usually just fire it, because if you don't fire it, then you're losing out on potential DPS, and you probably have another shot coming in by the time the next one appears. It's definitely not the easiest plant to use in the game, but with enough shots flying, the mid to late game of a level can be very simple to deal with. The only potential issue is that Banana is barely not enough to kill Buggerheads, but this is rarely an issue, as the poor plants like the aforementioned Celery are more than capable of cleanup. And free Banana Shots is enough to kill guards when they appear, and in an AoE space. This allows Banana to be one of the best answers to guards appearing often late game, taking them down very reliably. Overall, I think this plant is among the greatest in the game, and should definitely be part of the discussion for best of the plants. It's not flawless, it does have some very, very clear weaknesses after all, but it's far stronger than people think. I just think people need to look past the seemingly lesser range, and use it as a banana launcher, not a replacement for Cobb Cannon, because if you do, this thing will wreck half a game if let be. It's underrated because people just don't quite get it, they don't really have the time to, but it's still certainly better than people may expect. One of the weirdest things about making this video is think about how some of the plants have changed so much because of some seemingly incredibly random changes. Here's an example, originally the plants were unlocked in a very different order. The player had access to every world at once, or a select few of their choice instead of the linear way they work now. It's weird to think about, but it shows how certain decisions can greatly impact a lot of the game. Now the game is linear, a lot of the overpowered plants are now gone so late they hardly matter. See Dusklobber, probably the greatest damage option in the entire game. It's no longer so absurd as it used to be, because while Modern Day is a fairly easy world due to some comedically bad level design at times, it's now so late that the player isn't able to rush through it and get Dusklobber immediately. The player gets a banana so late that it can't help out in worlds like Neon Mistake 2 or Jurassic Marsh. Sure, it's still strong, and you will get it late either way due to the fact Big Wave Beach is on par to the hardest world in the game, but it completely neutered the plants. Some plants too used to be far stronger. Sunstream was an incredibly easy plant to get. Laser Spin and Primal Pea Shitter used to be so much stronger when they were gotten nearly instantly, and so on. This may seem irrelevant to this video, but I think it's important to note something. A plant being overrated and underrated is all about player perception. 
a plan can't be overrated or underrated without the players underrating or overrating it. And this can include where they are placed above all else. Dust Globber is still strong, Mandel's levels exist after it, as well as flying events and such, but it's generally considered weaker now than it used to be due to placement changes, and this applies to all plants. I guess what I'm trying to say is keep an eye on every plant. No plant PZ2 is utterly worthless. Every plant has a niche, something it can do. It may be rare, but they will be worthwhile, and very much so. Always remember that. Anyways, I have to go rub my hand as I've been playing in San Aquarium recently, and that game will murder your hands hard. Ow! This has been Creeps, and have a good one.